Well, we're turning now to uh, James chapter 3 for our message for this morning. James chapter 3 and verse 17 and verse 18. James 3 verse 17 and 18. James says, but that wisdom that is from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, and easy to be entreated, full of mercy and good fruits, without partiality and without hypocrisy. And the fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. Our message this morning is simply this, where is wisdom? We might say, what is wisdom? But I'm asking a, a particular question, where is wisdom found? James chapter 3 and verse 17 and 18. Let me just pray very briefly as the word of God is now before us. Father in heaven, your word now is before us, this word which is our life. It is our light, it is the lamp unto our feet. Guide us and direct us in the ways in which we should go. By the word of thy mouth, the psalmist says, we have kept ourselves or we can keep ourselves from the, the mouth of the destroyer. Oh Father, what precious words these are and they are so needed in our day and in every day. Please Lord, be the teacher that we need. Help me, Father, not just in preaching but to explain, to make the message clear and bold and straightforward and may it be a message that is glorifying to God. It's not to praise man, it is to magnify the Lord. That is our desire, it is our longing. And our cry, Lord, is come by where we are and speak to us in Jesus' name. Amen. It goes without saying that wisdom is sorely needed at every turn and in our every step as God's people. The unfolding of recent events the, the last number of weeks has only brought this to my attention once again. What do we say on occasions? What do we say when we are presented with all sorts of questions that come and fly at us from all sorts of angles and directions? It's a, a difficult thing to, to answer, isn't it? How do we act? How do we respond when we are confronted and when we are faced with so many conflicting thoughts, opinions and ideas that are swirling around us? It's at times overwhelming. That's personally how I feel and have felt on occasions. And I'm sure that I speak for many of you as well. It is always good at such times to, to ground ourselves and to bring ourselves back to the word of God. And if we can, and we should do this, to put to one side many of these things to bring ourselves back to a biblical and a scriptural focus. As if we're trying to get ourselves back on the pathway we, we may have uh, got lost as it were on a journey found ourselves exploring areas of a wood that we never intended to be in in the first place we need to get back to a pathway don't we and I, and I find myself and I'm sure that you do as well that when you spend time in scripture and you get before the word of God you realize that so many of these things these ideas these thoughts these speculations whatever they may be how distracting how discouraging they really can be and all of our true source of strength and encouragement is, is right here, believer. It's right there in the word of God. In the midst of all this, the, the question arises, what is wisdom? And how are we to exercise and to demonstrate wisdom when there is so much foolishness and that which is not wise prevailing in society? Therefore, it brings us to this matter of determining not only what wisdom is in a biblical sense, but how it is to be seen in action. Now, unquestionably, the Bible refers on many occasions to wisdom. And it's not my intention this morning in this message to deal with every facet and every part and every way in which wisdom is revealed in Scripture. For example, we might speak of the fear of God being at the beginning of wisdom, but that's not my intention this morning of dealing with that particular aspect of wisdom. I'm dealing exclusively with what we have here in James 3 and verse 7 and 18. But, but suffice it to say in our opening thoughts that the Bible speaks much of wisdom. It is a book of wisdom, is it not? Because it is the word of God that comes from the mouth of God and God himself is infinite in his own wisdom. 
Whether we think of the many references that you will discover in, say, for example, the book of Proverbs, there in the Old Testament, and Proverbs is filled with many instances where wisdom is used and explained and illustrated for us. Or whether we go to the very life of our Lord Jesus Christ, who is the wisdom of God. The Bible calls the Lord Jesus the power of God. And the Bible calls our Saviour the wisdom of God. And do you know something, Christian? When you became a Christian, when you were born of the Holy Spirit of God, when you were saved from your sin, do you know what happened in your life? Christ was made unto you wisdom. That's what the Apostle Paul tells us in the New Testament Scriptures. So without doubt it's a subject that is dealt with broadly from cover to cover and from book to book. And I encourage you and urge you in your own quiet time to take up that study and to look at the many references to wisdom in Holy Scripture. But also James that we are turning to here has much to say about wisdom himself and his letter. A very unique letter when you compare it to other New Testament epistles or letters that we read. Now, this is not the first time James has mentioned wisdom. That is chapter 3 and verse 17. If you have a good memory or if you can think quickly upon your feet, you'll know that at the very beginning of James and chapter 1, he has mentioned wisdom beforehand. What does he say in James 1 and verse 5? Or well, shall we read those words? James 1 and verse 5. He says, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not and it shall be given him. It's very important that we understand uh, the, the context and the reason as to why James was dealing with wisdom there in chapter 1 and verse 5. He had been telling the people of God about the inevitable trials that come in the Christian life. He says that we can count it all joy when we fall into these various trials or temptations. And there's a little word that James goes on to speak about. He reminds Christians that uh, there is a work that God is doing, doing through our trials. And, he, and James is saying to believers, and of course God is saying through James, he's saying, let, let God have his work. Let, let this work be done. Let patience be established in your life. You see, God is always doing something when these trials and the tribulations, they come our way. God is not mocking you. He's not ridiculing me. He's not trying to uh, sort of put us down and humble us for no reason. Uh, we, we, we've, we've dealt with this on many occasions. Whatever the trial or the temptation or difficulty may be, there is in the, the eyes of God a desire that we grow and we develop. And that the spiritual virtues and graces and, and uh, if I can use other words, the spiritual qualities that show the Christian to be exactly what they should be. They are flourishing as a result. This is one of the unique features of the Christian. That when we are in the crucible of all testing and trial, there is a coming forth as gold. Now I think James is preempting this experience. And maybe some believers say, you know, James, we don't have the wisdom for this. We don't have the strength for this. We can't handle any of this. And so James says in verse 5 of chapter 1, well, if you lack wisdom, ask of God. What a word for, for me in a pastoral capacity for you. And what a word for you in the in a sense of being a member of a church, an individual Christian, when it comes to how you respond and react to any given situation. We all lack wisdom. That is inevitable. And yet the Christian is now in his blessed position where we can go to God in prayer and we can say, Lord, I lack wisdom in knowing what I need to do in this situation. And the Lord says, ask of me. Ask of me. And I will give you generously, liberally. Well, James has dealt with wisdom there in chapter 1 and verse 5. He deals with it again in the verse which we're dealing with this morning in our main message. Wisdom is often described by people, and I'm using a very general description now. It's often generally described as the quality of having experience, knowledge, and good judgment. That's as good as far as it goes, by the way. So we might look around and we see people 
whether in positions of authority or people that we work with or friends that we know of. No, they, they might not even be Christian. And many of them aren't Christian. And they don't have a Christian mindset, thinking or background or a worldview. But we understand that at times can exercise areas of wisdom. Wisdom that is unrelated to God. And yet at the same time, we should say that still it's a, it's a common grace which is given by God. And so many people may uh, show wisdom in their knowledge, in their judgment, in their common sense. We admire it, we're thankful for it, and we can also benefit as a result from it. However, let me make it very clear that that definition of wisdom is something very different from that which the scripture or the Bible uh, describes wisdom to be. Let me give you uh, a different summary. Let me give you a different way of describing biblical wisdom. And I'm fitting this into the words of James here, chapter 3, verse 17. Wisdom, my dear friend, resides, or wisdom is found in the believer, the Christian, applying gospel truth to his or her life and living out that truth unto the glory of God. In, to use other words in scripture, when we set our affections on those things which are above, we display in the eyes of God biblical wisdom. That is what we do. It is that which may be foolish to someone else. And that which may be ridiculed by another person. And you may well know someone who is not a Christian. And they look at you. And they look at the way in which you demonstrate wisdom. And the way you live out your Christian life. And they say, that's foolish. What a foolish life you are living. What a waste of your life. What a waste of your existence. But you understand, Christian, that you're not to take your, uh, your, your guide or your lessons or your influences from the thoughts of the world. But you want to understand that God has given us his mind in the scripture. And he shows us what wisdom is. And it's right before your very eyes here in James 3 and verse 17 and 18. And therefore it is to this place that we are brought here in our message this morning. It is worth noting how James arrives here. Have you noticed what he says in verse 17? But the wisdom that is from above is first, and then we'll deal with those words afterwards. But notice something very carefully and very importantly before we go any further. He reminds us that there is a contrast here. There is a difference. He reminds us that there are alternatives that will and inevitably try to pass for wisdom. And they will always be of an earthly, carnal and a worldly and fleshly nature. And he's dealt with that in verse 15 and verse 16. He speaks of a wisdom that is not from God but which is from earth itself. And what he means is it's man-centered, it's man-created, it is man-generated and it is not of God. And there will always be those counterfeits. There will always be those contrasts. There will always be something that is offered to us as a different option in life. James' his, his desire is that the believer gets themselves fixed and focused upon wisdom that is from above. Because that is where we're setting our affection. And so if we are to understand wisdom in the capacity or in the role of the Christian how we are to be wise in our living, it is that which comes from God. It is from above and it comes into our life. And as a result, it's then to be lived out. It's not God's will that we just draw from the very blessings of God and we contain them. No, we live out the wisdom. So it's wisdom that is received, I might even add, first and foremost, by way of conversion to Jesus Christ. Let me say this very clearly. There will be no demonstration of wisdom which is pleasing to God in your life. Unless you have first been made right with God through Jesus Christ. That is the first step of wisdom. And it doesn't matter how shrewd you are. It doesn't matter how smart you may be. It doesn't matter how clever you are. It doesn't matter how cautious and how wise in other people's minds you are in your decision making. And how pragmatic you may be. And whatever word we want to use. If you have not found peace with God. You do not possess wisdom with God. 
And I urge you, whoever you are and wherever you are, before you hear anything else, I have to say, with relation to wisdom in the Christian life, are you still fighting against God? Do you still count the things of Jesus Christ as a foolish thing? Or have you seen the wisdom of the cross and your need of salvation? Wisdom that is born of the Spirit of God. We'll deal with that very shortly in a moment. Will work itself out. You look at James 3 and verse 13. Again, the question is being asked, who is a wise man and endued with knowledge among you? Who's that wise person among you? Well, James gives us the answer. Let him show out of a good conversation or good behaviour his works with meekness of wisdom. So all, all that James has in mind here, biblical wisdom, it's from above, it's worked out in our life. And then we're asking the question, well then, where is it? What is this biblical wisdom? Therefore, wisdom or wise or godly living can be determined by what it is and what it is not. And now we turn to our main points for this morning. First of all, it has a heavenly origin. And I've touched on that very briefly and I'm going to just explain it in more detail now. It has a heavenly origin. Look at verse 17. But that wisdom, that is from above. So do you see, if you're listening to this message... How the Lord through James is, is, is directing us to a certain and a definitive place. This is not something that is shrouded in dark and impenetrable mysteries. It's not vague. It's not concealed. We, we can discover where it's found from. We know where it comes from. The wisdom of God is from above. Have you noticed that? This is one of the great contrasts that the Bible, the Word of God, gives to us, dear friend. The Scripture will always show us that anything that is, what I've said before, of the earth or what is carnal or, or fleshly, it will, it will so often fail us. It, it, it always will. We have all been on the receiving end of leaning and resting too much upon a person or upon an individual, or upon a thought or a persuasion of some given person. And we have been terribly let down and disappointed. Thank God the Lord doesn't do this. And we, if we rest ourselves and we lean and we rely upon our skills, and our own wisdom, and our own craft, and our own guile, and all of these things, we're, we're heading for disaster. That has been proven time and time again, and I suggest you, you just take a look around and you'll see that. You'll see it in the news, you'll see it in the media, you'll see it everywhere. Thank God the word of God gives us a different direction. And there in James 1 and verse 17, what does James do? He directs us again to the Lord Jesus Christ. Every good, every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. And when he speaks of all that God does for the believer, James is saying in that very important passage that God is not going to allure you and tempt you into sin. That's not what he's doing. Even if he tries you, it's for your good and it's for his glory. How could God do this? How, how, we're not to err. Every good gift is from God. We might not always see it or perceive it of being good, but it is. The one who is the father of lights. When we think of the first and most important part of our salvation, regeneration, dear friend. Being born again, it's from above, as I've just mentioned. It has a heavenly origin. And therefore it follows that every grace in our Christian life, every virtue, every honourable feature or characteristic of the child of God can show and demonstrate and trace it as being from above. So all that we are is a demonstration of all that he is to us. Do you not see this is what the desire of James is and what the, 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 the language of scripture is all about? Every quality that we demonstrate, every, every exhibition of wisdom in our life is that we are signposts. And we say, this is because of what God has done for me. And so he says in verse 17, but that wisdom which is from above, 
Therefore, wisdom and wise living comes under the great umbrella of sanctification. Often the problem is that we try to to do all that we are trying to do in our own strength. We do it in our own abilities and we fail time and time again. We cannot win victories by relying upon earthly means. Without doubt, we we must be doing. I mean, look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse 12 and 13. It speaks of God worketh in you both to do uh, and to uh, both to will and to do of his good pleasure, but he speaks also of working out our salvation with fear and trembling, not making ourselves Christians, but from the, the, the starting point of being in Christ, that we have a responsibility and we have a duty to do all the things which are pleasing to God, but God is working in us all the time. This is what James is starting with here. Why his living has a cause which is from above. It will never be achieved perfectly in life. I'll tell you that as a fact. I'll I'll be the first to say to you how I have often failed in areas of wisdom. How I stand right before you now in sore need of wisdom from God. And I'm not ashamed, I'm not afraid to say it. And I hope you're not as well. And it's why we come to the word of God for such a time as this. Because we get on our knees before a holy God. And we say, Lord, when I don't know what to say, And when I don't know where to turn, and I'm not sure what decision to make, I'm asking you for wisdom. Because, Lord, you've done everything that I need in my salvation. And you are my God and my Lord, and you are the one who is unto me my wisdom. And the Lord says it's from above. And therefore, turn your eyes upon him, my friend, and and seek God for wisdom that you need. It has a heavenly origin. Now for the main part of our message, and it really is the main part because my last point is more of a concluding thought. Secondly, it has a Christ-like operation. It has a heavenly origin. It has a Christ-like operation. And we come to what James says. It is first pure. I'm not going to repeat these words because we're going to go through them systematically. What you'll notice here is that there is a sequence of thoughts There is even an operation that is before us here. I do not believe, and I believe this very strongly, by the way, in my views on Scripture, and I believe it to be true in all parts of Scripture. I do not believe that when you come to a list of words, that they are thrown together haphazardly. I am of the mind of persuasion, and always they come to us in sequence. One will always result and flow from the other. The Beatitudes, for example, is a classic example. The fruit of the Spirit there in Galatians chapter 5. They all, one, rely upon the other. There's an order, there's a system, there's a sequence that God is establishing. He's given us his word. He doesn't just scatter the words across scripture. It's why we should be those that read the word systematically. And add line to line and thought to thought with the help of God. It's a beautiful portion, by the way, in James 3 and verse 17. One pastor, um, he's retired now, Jeffrey Thomas, in his uh, sermon on, on the epistle of James, he makes the point, he notes that when you look at the original Greek, there is alliteration in play here. Uh, for example, four words begin with the letter E in the original Greek. And two words with the letter A. And and often you find, especially more in Hebrew, when you have a similar thing taking place, that there is a beauty that is combined with the truth. So that when the word of God was being read and heard, not only was there a dynamic truth that was being preached, but it came with such force and beauty that it would just instill itself in the hearts of those that were listening and reading. Now we don't have that in our English, but nonetheless, my friend, when you read the word of God here, it is not, it's, it's not possible uh, to, to sort of you know, not see, if I can use these words, the beauty in the word of God and the force of this language. There is a, an importance which is here. Again, there is a, a contrast all along in verse 16. He's already dealt with envying and strife and confusion and every evil work. And it's if James is saying, that's not wisdom. How can that be? Let me tell you what this wisdom is. 
Let me tell you where it's found. When, when we're done with, uh, with all of these words, what you will discover is that wise living is to be like Christ because everything that James says here is perfectly fulfilled and satisfied in him. Christ is the perfection of all of these qualities. Do you realise that? Your, your saviour, the Lord Jesus Christ, is perfect in his purity, in his peaceableness, in his gentleness, in his mercy. He is without partiality, he is without hypocrisy. So that's why I'm saying that wisdom is to have a Christ-like operation. So we're going to go through these words and do it as best as we can. Pure. It's wisdom which is from above, it's first pure. Purity is the necessity which dominates everything else. Jesus says in Matthew 5, 48, Be therefore perfect, even as your Father which is in heaven is perfect. The Lord Jesus on that occasion was not suggesting, uh, suggesting that Christians can attain sinless perfection, but he's saying strive for it. Strive for a purity in your life to be chaste and clean and modest and pure in a world that is anything but that constitutes the great battle and struggle that we all face. And people will laugh and say, oh, don't be like that. In a metaphorical sense, let your hair down and do what you want. But that's not wise. God identifies a life that is pleasing to God as, 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 as wise. Because it's the demonstration of the fear of God in your life. I go as far as saying that we may have all things in place. We can have wisdom in our organisation. We can have wisdom in our planning. We can have wisdom in our separation. We can have wisdom in our preaching. But all these things lack any power. We have no purity. Philippians 4.8 Whatsoever things are true and honest and just and pure and lovely and of good report. If there be any virtue, we might even add. And I'm not adding to scripture, but you know what I'm doing here. I'm just giving you a... An illustration, if there be any wisdom, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Wise living is godly living. Never, never forget that. It is pure, it is peaceable. Uh, Paul spoke of a similar thing. In Hebrews 12, 11, he spoke about the peaceable fruit of righteousness. Wise living consists of purity, which in turn will create peaceableness, not just peace by virtue of being a Christian, but also affecting and demonstrating and living out peace in your life. Peacefulness is not determined by the way what man thinks it to be. Let's, let's get that right. Again, let's go to the Beatitudes, Matthew 5, 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Note where that word appears in the Beatitudes, after those who were to be pure in heart and before those that may be persecuted for righteousness sake. Again, we, we live in a day, and we have them for many years, where the false ecumenical view is being propounded and suggested that, that, that churches just, just you know, get together, no matter who you are and what you believe and what doctrine you hold to and what doctrine is denied. And, 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 if, and if you just get together and you all can strive for peace, then it doesn't really matter what you hold to and what you believe. Because the great aim that for many is, this, is peace, but at the expense of purity, at the expense of truth, that's not of God. That's not heavenly, that's earthly, that's carnal thinking, that's unbiblical thinking. True peace, yes, will do all that is can, that is in the fear of God, to maintain peace between fellow believers and maintain biblical unity. And I'm a strong believer at, at, at that, but not at the expense of the purity of God and his doctrine. We do not welcome a peace that compromises the truth of God. But what we do welcome and desire is peaceableness that promotes purity. And when the word of God is being upheld, we must do all that we can to maintain peace among fellow believers. And that will often include a submission to the will of God in all things. In, in fact, that does include at all times the submission to God and his will. 
It is also gentle. Have you noticed what James says in, in chapter 3 verse 17? It is gentle. Gentle. Wisdom is gentle. It's not brash. It's not aggressive. It's not harsh. It's gentle. Moderation and patience. It's a, a word that is used elsewhere which is very familiar with this word here. One man, Robert Johnson, said this. The Christian man loves to make allowances for the ignorance and weaknesses of others, knowing how great need he stands in constantly of having allowance made for himself both by God and man. Patience and gentleness that is willing to forgive even when we might have a right to condemn. It's gentle. And there's much more that could be said on that title, but I leave that there. Next one, it is easy to be entreated. Wisdom is easy to be entreated. That's what he says in verse 17. It's a lovely expression, isn't it? Again, it relates on from gentleness. We might say gentleness is something of the inward demonstration of a pure, peaceable life. And it has now this, this outward veneer and character and face to it. And now we're saying, well, well how is it seen? How is it in operation? It's easy to be entreated. It, it might remind us of the common soldier who is under authority and submissive to the orders that he has received. Now it doesn't mean we become pushovers. It doesn't mean that we're spiritual wimps, metaphorically with soft fingers and an unsteady resolve. But my friend, neither does it mean that we are stubborn and unyielding in our ways. It means that we're easy to be entreated. It means that we can yield and we do yield when necessary. Sometimes a change of mind is a sign of weakness. I think James touches on that elsewhere. A double-minded man. You're always you know, one way, another way. You're, 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 you're strong here, you're weak there, you're thinking this, you're thinking that. And we might identify that at times as not being good and it isn't good. But there are times when you may be convinced of something and then... From another angle, and a good angle, a biblical angle, a, um, a Christian influence comes your way. And you think to yourself, or you think again, well maybe that's not the, the right way of thinking. There's, a, there's a, an ease in which you can be entreated. You're not closed down, you're not tunnel visioned. You're not shut into one thought process, unable to break free from it. No, there's a need to be easy to be entreated, yielding, submitting to God in all of his ways. How we work all this out in terms of then you know, contending for truth and taking a stand when necessary. Well, that, that's part of our Christian life. That's part of the complexity of it all. I freely admit it's one of the most difficult things. But what I cannot deny here is that God is saying that wisdom will be easy to be entreated. And, 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 and I have got a duty to understand what that means and do it. And so do you. And I remind you of our Lord Jesus Christ. He submitted himself to the humiliation that he knew for our sakes. There are times when he did not open his mouth when he could have. But he didn't. When he could have confounded accusations time and time again, but he didn't. On, oca on occasions in his life, he did speak. But in the most agonizing of times, he didn't. 1 Peter 5 verse 5 reminds us of this and says, Yea, all of you be subject one to another and be clothed with humility. For God resisteth the proud and giveth grace to the humble. So many of our problems are created, our unwise decisions made because there is an unwillingness to back down. The individual is not easy to be entreated. And I encourage you to understand and to grasp what wisdom is. And for me to do the same. Full of mercy and of good fruits. The time again is not allowing me to develop these points really any further. And I'm just going to leave these thoughts with you. Wise living is merciful living. Again it's a, an offshoot of being easy to be entreated. False wisdom is signified by confusion, strife and every evil work. James has told us such in previous verses. But wise living is crammed full of mercy. 
Those amongst us who are most gracious and most merciful often are the most wise. They demonstrate the likeness of Christ in the midst of their life. And why? Why? Well, the biblical model is clear. Because we've received mercy. We've been forgiven. We've been pardoned. We're not to be then for our unmerciful, are we? It is without partiality and lastly without hypocrisy. And these are negatives. These should not be present in our life. And these are two things which James has already condemned in his letter to this stage because of their devastating effect upon an individual Christian or the church of Jesus Christ. There is no place, I said, for masquerading in the church. We cannot have masks and pretend to be something that we're not because we're just fooling ourselves. We're not fooling God. And James is saying here, wisdom will not be hypocritical. It will not have a biased, partial manner. So then, here is a Christ-like operation. And I, and I finish with my closing thought it has a righteous outcome. Verse 18. The fruit of righteousness is sown in peace of them that make peace. And here he speaks of what this righteous living will result in being. And what the effect it will be in biblical religion. And oh how we desperately need it. And what he does is draw on that classic and most common illustration of all. The law of harvest. You reap what you sow. Putting it like this, if we as believers sow in peace, we will reap a righteous harvest. If we sow in wisdom, well, a bountiful supply will be ours. But if all we do is sow in strife, and sow in confusion, and sow in contention, and envy, and bitterness, and malice, and hating, and backbiting, and gossiping, and slander, and all of these things, are we really going to expect anything of God? Maybe that's where we are in our present day. Maybe we're suffering as we are as uh, a church broadly speaking. And I'm speaking throughout the world now. Because for many years we've been sowing very unwisely. And we have been far from what we need to be. What's the answer you say? What if we're in a day where the Lord is chastening his church? What if it's a, it's a message to wake us up to our need of him? Well, Hosea 10, 12 to do message. Sow to yourselves in righteousness. Reap in mercy. Break up your fallow ground. For it is time to seek the Lord till he come and rain righteousness upon you. Again, James has said it before. If you lack wisdom, ask of God. Let's seek him today. Let's get back to the Lord and call upon his name. And say, Lord, break up this ground. It's time for us to seek you. We need wisdom from above. May God bless his word to our hearts. Let's pray. Oh God, our Father, our confession is that we need you every day. Lord, pour out thy spirit upon us in these days. Open up the windows of heaven that we sense are closed. And pour us out a blessing, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.